Chers collègues, chers amis, uh, bonjour, uh, bienvenue, welcome to Massey College. Rosham Adid, Pokhair Ragli. My name is Paya Mahavand, and it is my honor as the Massey Chair in Human Rights to make some brief introductory remarks to open the conference Silenced Voices, Gender Persecution, and Women's Rights in Afghanistan and Iran. This event has been organized by Massey College with the support of the Elohe Omidyar Mir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies and the International Human Rights Program at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. I'm also grateful for the generous support of uh, Debe Voice and Plimpton uh, in New York. So I welcome you on behalf of all the sponsors of this event. I begin by acknowledging that Massey College, where we gather today, is built on land where many indigenous peoples have lived. It is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward the land and the great privilege we have to work on this land. Today, International Women's Day is an occasion to celebrate the achievement of women across the world. Yet, for the women of Iran and Afghanistan, this day is a reminder of the oppression and discrimination they have suffered for years. It is a reminder of the prolonged denial of their humanity at the hands of those who have elevated misogyny to an expression of the sacred and divine. On December 10th of last year, I had the honor to attend the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony in Oslo, Norway, in solidarity with the Iranian human rights champion, Nagis Mohammadi. While the world celebrated her heroism in Oslo, in Tehran, the Iranian authorities continued to imprison her for the crime of demanding equality for women. There was at the podium in the majestic hall where the ceremony was held, an empty chair. In a better world, she would have been sitting there waiting to receive the prize. Beside the empty chair sat her twin teenage children, Kiana and Ali, living in exile, who haven't seen their mother for nine years. Instead of an innocent childhood, with birthday celebrations and trips to the zoo, their early memories are of the violent arrest of their mother at their home, of their family being ripped apart, of visits to the prison where a loving smile and tearful eyes behind the cold iron bars of the prison became a substitute for the warm embrace of their mother. On the floor of the Nobel Peace Center, there was a symbolic square, two meters by three meters. It was a representation of the isolation cell where Nargis has been kept in prolonged solitary confinement, deprived of natural light, deprived of fresh air, deprived of human contact. The conditions of this white torture, she wrote, leave a crack in a part of the human mind. But even outside that confined space, she and other women live in a larger prison, a prison called Iran, where women like 22-year-old Mahsa Amini are murdered with impunity simply for failing to observe the mandatory hijab laws of the Islamic Republic. Next door, in Afghanistan, their sisters, with whom they share so much in common, suffer an even worse fate. Across the border, in the so-called Islamic Emirate, the return of the Taliban has become a living hell for women. 
They're denied the right to work, to get education. Their movement is restricted. They are banned from public places. They face surveillance, harassment, assault, arbitrary detention, torture, and exile, all for the crime of being a woman. They suffocate under their burqas, so ignorant men are not tempted. Their dreams are turned into ashes, so the delusional beliefs of fanatics are not offended. This is Afghanistan, the most dangerous country in the world to be a woman. We have in the room and online today those who know this story very well, those who have lived these experiences, which for some might be a mere abstraction. Those of us who remember that in the 1970s, before the revolution and wars, the militarization and extremism, before the geopolitical games and power struggles that ripped our world apart, those of us who remember that women used to wear miniskirts in the streets of Kabul, in the streets of Tehran, that they would go to the cinema, that they would go dancing and dining, that we had notable women who were accomplished scientists and artists and ministers and judges, that we went to schools where boys and girls played together in the schoolyard. Those of us who remember this lost world from the past are faced with a paradoxical longing to go back to the future. We are confronted with the painful realization that in our countries, we must go backwards half a century in order to move forwards. For the women of Afghanistan, it may be even more difficult to digest given the recent progress on women's rights that has now been reversed. It is difficult under such circumstances not to lose hope. It is difficult not to despair. But at a time like this, we are reminded of the immortal words of Rumi, the exile from Balkh in present-day Afghanistan, that the wound is the place where the light enters you. The story of the women of Iran and Afghanistan is not just one of oppression. It is also the story of exceptional courage and astonishing resilience. It is also a story of defiance and struggle. The Iranian women who stand in front of the Basij thugs chanting Zan Zendegi Azadi, woman, life, freedom. The Afghan women who stand in front of the Taliban thugs chanting non kar azadi, food, work, freedom. The women who expose themselves to beatings and insults and bullets and worse so they can speak truth to power. They teach us the meaning of dignity. They demonstrate the potentialities inherent in human beings in the face of injustice. In their resistance, they expose the violence and ultimately the weakness, the weakness of those who need to dominate others to feel powerful. But beyond the visible struggle in the streets, there is also the invisible struggle of everyday routines, of those who own and operate businesses to feed their families, of those who serve their neighbors and communities with compassion, of those who nurture and educate the next generation, those who run women's organizations underground and inspire their sisters to go on when all is seemingly lost. It is often this quotidian heroism beneath the surface that builds the foundation for a better tomorrow. Massey College brands itself as the place where people and ideas intersect. The ideas around gender persecution and human rights that we will explore today are, of course, important. But the people, the people who have come together around those ideas are even more important. And what a truly exceptional group of people you are, 
people we are so honored to host, confident that in this meeting, in this sharing of experiences and resources, new ideas and understandings, new plans and strategies will, where it will emerge as we ponder in exile how to help those who stayed behind and whose fate haunts us. The very organization of this event is an expression of a spirit of defiance and resilience, which brings me to the next speaker, my distinguished co-chair, Rizal Harris, a constitutional lawyer who was the first ombudsperson of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and a senior resident of Massey College, who in fact deserves all the credit for bringing this gathering to realization. I've watched with profound admiration how she, with all the pain and anguish, all the pain and anguish, that those of you who were forced to leave Afghanistan recently are well aware of, that she has pulled together this event in addition to all her other efforts. Thank you, Rizal, for your leadership. I also recognize the tremendous efforts of Alyssa Ginsberg in the back, who you will be seeing running around all day today, whose hard work and dedication behind the scenes have been invaluable to the organization of this conference. Dear friends, distinguished colleagues, I will end my introductory remarks with the moving words of the great Iranian feminist poet Furur Baruchzad, an inspiration for many who search for a way out of this darkness. In her poem entitled Asir, or Captive, she writes, Man on sham'am ke ba suze dele khish furuzan nikonam viranei ra. I am that candle that illuminates the ruins with the burning of her heart. Thank you once again for joining us today. And once again, welcome to Massey College. I would now call on my distinguished co-chair, uh, Rizal, to make some introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Akhavan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Salam, subhamisham bakhair. Good morning. Happy International Women's Day. It, it's great to be here and to have this conversation on such an important day. And we're so happy um, that each and every one of you gathered here today for this important discussion on gender persecution and women's rights in Afghanistan and Iran. It's truly an honor to see such a diverse and passionate group of individuals coming together to address one of the most pressing issues of our time. So once again, welcome and thank you for joining us in person and online. As we gather here today, it's important to recognize the persistent challenges faced by women around the world. Despite decades of advocacy in the establishment of various domestic and international legal frameworks to protect their rights, women across the world still struggle for their rights in equal treatment. In some regions, such as Afghanistan and Iran, the situation is particularly dire. In Iran, women suffer from gender inequality and repression for many years now. Discriminatory laws and practices, including mandatory veiling and gender-based violence and persecution restrict women's freedom and perpetuate patriarchal norms. Mahsa Amini's death exemplifies state enforced violence against women in Iran. It sheds light on the systemic failures to protect women's rights and to protect women from violence. In the aftermath of Mahsa's death, we witnessed how women who protested against the authorities faced oppression and brutality. Many were arrested, detained, and subject to violence and intimidation by security forces. In Afghanistan, under the rule of the Taliban, women have been systematically deprived of their fundamental rights and freedoms. The recent report of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Afghanistan that was published last week reads, the situation of women and girls continue to deteriorate. 
the violations reported previously regarding rights to education, employment, and participation in public and political life, and freedoms of movement, peaceful assembly, association, opinion, and expression continues uh, continue to perpetuate widespread and institutionalized discrimination against women and girls in all areas of life. The report highlights the harsh enforcement of the Taliban's dress code since early this year, including arbitrary, um, including arbitrary and violent deprivation of liberty of women and girls who are perceived not to comply with the gendered roles that the Taliban have assigned to them in the society. The Taliban's arbitrary arrest of women protesters and their persecution and torture are nothing short of horrifying. A few stories that have been compiled by Zan Times show the magnitude of violation and brutalities by the Taliban. One of the female protesters, Farzia, explains how the Taliban interrogated her and her friends day and night and threatened them with guns. They were not provided food or water. The prison guards threatened them that they wouldn't see their families ever again. And they will get stoned to death. Farzia was pregnant when she was arrested. She writes how the stress of the horrors of detention and the tortures inflicted by the Taliban caused her a miscarriage. A miscarriage in her cell, but the Taliban did not provide her any medical help for days. Nargis Sadat, another female protester, was arrested and accused of standing against the Islamic government, the so-called Islamic government. The Taliban threw a hot cup of tea to her face, hitting her eye and burning her face and head. Nargis writes, and I quote, they grabbed my ears and pulled my hair. It felt like my soul was dying. They left me in the room for days without water. I cried and shouted that the room was wet. I was menstruating and my conditions were terrible, but no one listened or responded. My feet were swelling and I felt suffocated. I was trying to find a corner in the room where I felt some oxygen was reaching me. Mahsa, Farzia, and Narges, their tales are just a few among countless other of women who have dared to raise their voices against oppression, only to face brutality, persecution at the hands of the ruling regimes. Their experiences show the harsh realities faced by women living under these oppressive regimes where, uh, where speaking out against injustices leads to retaliation and persecution. Against this backdrop of oppression and injustice, our gathering takes an added significance. By bringing together a diverse array of voices and perspectives, we have an opportunity to examine the multifaceted challenges confronting women in Afghanistan and in Iran. We hope that through rigorous analysis, informed dialogue, and collaborative action, we can explore pathways towards meaningful change and tangible progress. Together, we can amplify their voices, demand accountability from those in power, and try to secure a future where all women can live free from fear and discrimination. Before I conclude, I extend my gratitude to our co-sponsors, the staff of Massey College and Elaha Omidvar Institute for Iranian Studies, and our volunteers who have played a huge part in making this gathering possible. Additionally, I would thank our respected speakers for, for coming, for those who, who managed to come to Toronto, for coming all the way, and for speaking and sharing their invaluable insights and experiences with us today. I would like to thank each and every individual um, in attendance, in person and online, whose presence and engagement are a testament to our collective commitment and to advancing women's rights. Last but certainly not least, I would like to thank Professor Fayom Akhavan for, for coming up with this idea, for being the chair of human rights at Massey College and ensuring that issues of significance with, when it comes to human rights and women's rights are being addressed. Let us stand united in our pursuit of equality, justice, and dignity for all women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rizal, for your words and a reminder of the grim reality uh, of the women on whose behalf we are speaking today. Uh, next, it is my great privilege to uh, introduce Professor Mohammed very distinguished colleague, dear friend, who is the inaugural director 
of the Elohe Omidyar Mir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies and Professor of Historical Studies, History and Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto. He's the founding chair of the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. He served as president of the International Society for Iranian Studies. He was the editor of Iran Name and is currently the editor in chief of Iran Namag, a bilingual quarterly of Iranian studies. And if that's not enough, he's co editor of the Iranian Studies book series published by Routledge. Thank you very much, Mohammed, please. Uh, greetings, everyone. As the inaugural director of the Elohim Midyarimir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies, I welcome you all, both in person and online, to Massey College and wish you an intellectually inspiring International Women's Day. I especially thank Professor Ghazal Paris and Professor Payam Akhaban, the visionary co conveners of today's conference, Silenced Voices gender persecution and women's rights in Afghanistan and Iran. Thanks to their extraordinary efforts and exemplary support of Alyssa Ginsberg, Silence Voices has brought together some of the most articulate and persuasive voices committed to women's rights and empowerment today. While encountering gender apartheid, in various aspects of their education, economic, social, and political life, which are dominated by the most repressive and patriarchal regimes in modern times, women of Afghanistan and Iran are the harbingers of a cosmopolitan and inclusionary future free from all forms of gender discrimination. This is clearly demonstrated by the woman life liberty movement that manifested after the death of Massa Amini in September 2022. I hope the gathering today can help devise various action plans for ending gender apartheid. Please enjoy the conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tabakoli. Um, I want to note also that we are online. We have an online uh, audience from across the world. Um, so uh, for those of you who are watching uh, online, uh, greetings and, and, and welcome. And uh, please put in the chat where you're located. It would be nice for us to know um, who is joining us from a distance. Um, and we would be interested to know what brings you to the conference today. Uh, please also feel free to share comments and questions in the chat throughout the day. Somebody will be uh, monitoring those uh, comments and questions. Additionally, please feel free to share about this event online. Massey College is on Instagram at Massey underscore college and at Twitter at Massey College. Uh, so please also tag Massey. Um, now we are going to... Um, be seeing a video that has been edited by uh, Saeed Zargar um, and it relates to the events after the takeover uh, by the Taliban in August of 2021 where as I alluded to earlier in my introductory remarks the women of Afghanistan had a major transition uh, backwards uh, losing the right to education work freedom of movement and any kind of free access to social, political, and civil liberties. While being in the midst of a very dire situation and growing security threats, though, the women of Afghanistan have continued to raise their voices and to ask for their rights through civil acts. In this video, you will briefly see how the lives of Afghanistan's women transitioned from a fragile democracy to complete oppression under the rule of Taliban. I would now ask you please to show the video.
مسلمانو اصیلو بالغو خزو لپارا شرعی حجاب ریایت کول فرض او ضروری دی حقا خزینا چه د عمر پلحاز زده یا وڑی نوی لنامحرمو نارینو سرا د مخامخ کدو پا محال با د فتنی لعمل د شرعی حدایاتو مطابق لسترگو پراتا خپل مخ ضرور پوتوي لکور څخه به موجب نه وتل د شرعي حجاب د رعایت لومړی او بهترین بڼه ده هغه میرمنې چې د امارت اړوند ارګانونو کې فعالیت کوي او حجاب نه رعایت کوي لدن دې ګو خکړه شي a powerful video that once again gave us a glimpse of the reality faced by those in whose name we have gathered today and i uh, recognize how painful it was for some members of our audience to relive those moments that uh, have shattered your lives we're pleased to welcome today two poets from iran and afghanistan creativity the spoken and written word and free expression are essential aspects of free and democratic societies. We welcome two powerful voices here with us today. The first poet that we will hear from is Banu Zan, a poet, translator, and poetry curator with over 280 published pieces and three books. She's the founder of Shabe Sher, Canada's most diverse and brave poetry series. Banu is the co-editor of the forthcoming anthology with Guernica Editions, Woman, Life, Freedom, Poems for the Iranian Revolution. Uh, Banu, please uh, come and please also let us know where we can find your work.
hello. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I, I would first like to take a few minutes to thank the organizers, um, the participants, the guests, um, um, and uh, people who are attending and in support. Uh, my name is Banu Zan, and uh, you just Google me. <laughs> uh, you have to try hard to, uh, to miss me. And, uh, but if you are interested, I have business cards. You could come and talk to me. My, the co-editor of the anthology actually is here, Saya Strom. You can approach us. You can talk to us about the anthology. And we are still accepting submissions until March 14th. We are also looking for donations to support the anthology. So feel free to spread the word, to submit, to donate to support in any possible way. I have chosen two poems for you. The first one is actually a translation of um, a poem by Afghan-Canadian poet, um, Fatima Akhtar. The translation is mine. It was published in Word City Literary Journal. Dar khayl kuchiyan biyaban gard, yek shamgah zar o nazar o zard. خورشید با شتاب بساتش بست دامان کشید و سوی سیاهی جست Among desert roaming nomads one evening the downcast sickly yellow sun collected her wares gathered her skirts and hurried towards the dark the tent was black the woman in pain her soul on fire Con consumed yet cold once more it's a girl what an end to nine months of fear and hope not a gunshot to announce good news nor a torch to grace the space the midwife not rewarded cast a shadow on her face on the man budam قدر قبیله کاست من بودم جدم رئیس ایل و تبارش بود دختر به خانه منشه آرش بود I was that unwanted girl the disgrace of the tribe for my ancestor the chief a girl was cause for shame an infant boy though headless was better than God forbid a girl Ashamed of my creation, I was a woman lost with bleeding heart. Nine months of fear and hope ended. Pain and sorrow increased twofold. Not welcomed, head covered in black. Mother was shamed for her birth. Amuhtam no host furudasti. As kaanato budano as hasti. جنسی به یک مبادله من بودم با زنده در معامله زن بودم I first learned inferiority from beings and being and life merchandise I was for exchange a loser in the bargain woman the second one is based on um, um, Nikosha Karami, a protester um, in the uh, woman life freedom movement in Iran. This has been published in Writers Resist. The Rise of a Martyr. At your memorial, the Lori song echoed on speakers. Daye, daye, vakht jange. Mother, mother, it's time for war. Today would have been your birthday. Forty days before, on the streets of Tehran, dead girl, living God, burning your hijab, darkness on fire, your darafsh kavyan, leading the chants, fearless, undaunted, unstoppable. You were the female kaveh, unlionized in epic. When the dictator's men closed in, revolutionaries dispersed in all directions as shooting stars in a galaxy. 
And then they were around you, tall, heavy men who beat and threw you into a car. That night, your phone was disconnected. All your photos and videos, dances and singing, gone. Today would have been your birthday. The search started in hospitals, prisons, morgues, days after your mother received a call. The kid was in our custody for a week. Revolutionary guards wanted to slowly interrogate her. After we built the case file, she was transferred to Evin Prison. Then the call came. The family summoned to identify your body. Today would have been your birthday. At your funeral, hundreds were waiting for your coffin that never arrived. Your lifeless body kidnapped, buried in some distant place. But the uprising was where the people were. At your tomb, that was not your tomb. Your mother held up your photo. No tears in her eyes. Today would have been your birthday, but is now your burial day. Shahadatat Mubarak Nika. Tavalodat Mubarak. Your martyrdom, Mubarak Nika. Your birthday, Mubarak. Thank you very much for that moving poetry. Next, we will welcome Jalal Nazari, born and raised in Afghanistan, bachelor's degree in English language and literature. He has a 2021-22 Dala Lana Global Journalism Fellow at the University of Toronto, uh, and was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal in Kabul. He is currently an MA student in Gender, Feminist, and Women's Studies at York University. Uh, Jalal, welcome, and please let us know where we can find your work. Uh, good morning. It's always a pleasure to be back in Massey College. Uh, thanks to uh, Bazal and Elisa for inviting me, and thanks to uh, uh, Professor Akhawan and all the other uh, people who have uh, come together to make this event happen. Uh, I'm going to read uh, two short poems. Um, the first one is about a woman who leaves her homeland and gets lost and never comes back. <clears throat> آواره بود چیزی به نام وطن نداشت آواره بود چیزی به نام وطن نداشت گم گشته بود فرصت پیدا شدن نداشت محتاب در مسیر شبش مهربان نبود سهمی از آفتاب به جز سوختن نداشت جز زخم های کهنه و نو در بدن نداشت جز رنج چند سال لباسی به تن نداشت یک عمر در سکوت و سیاهی اسیر بود بسیار قصه داشت ولی کن دهن نداشت می رفت در تراکم اندوه گم شود ناگاه مرده بود ولی گورکن نداشت زیباییش 
خلاصه یک شاهکار بود زیبایی که غیر خودش هیچ زن نداشت and the second one is from the perspective of a man who is at the same time a politician uh, a human and women's rights activist a poet um, uh, everything uh, and so it's like uh, um, it's hard to, to translate because there are a lot of cultural differences and irony it goes like پشت زنهای شهر سرگردان من فعال حقوق زن هستم پشت زنهای شهر سرگردان من فعال حقوق زن هستم گرچه در خانه با زن و خواهر مرد کچ خلق و بددهن هستم شاعر شعرهای یک سر بکر شهره به آتیست روشن فکر جمعه ها غرق سجده ام و ذکر این چونین آدم خفن هستم در طرفداری از دموکراسی ظاهرا هیچ کس حریفم نیست پای نفعم اگر وسط باشد اهل وجدان فروختن هستم در مساجد مبلغ دینم من خودم واضع قوانینم روز با کاروان هماینم شب ولی یار راه زن هستم نام من با جهاد شد رهبر نان مر شب به خون مردم تر چاهکن کی به چاه می افتد من که یک عمر چاهکن هستم من سیاستمدار افغانم مرد جنگیم و قماندانم باز هم شکر که مسلمانم خیر باشد که اهرمن هستم این که شغل وطن فروشی را برگزیدم ز روی اجبار است ورنه من زاده همین خاکم عاشق پرچم وطن هستم thank you so much thank you jalal may we have may we have more and more men who write poetry about women's rights <laughs> We are now, uh, before the first uh, panel begins, have uh, some brief remarks from uh, notable uh, guests who are in the uh, government of uh, Canada, the Parliament of Canada. Before introducing them, I wanted to just uh, briefly uh, recognize in our presence today the uh, distinguished Massey Chair in uh, Global and Engagement, Noor Jahan Mohani, who is sitting here, distinguished a diplomat and lawyer and human rights activist. Uh, so I'm very pleased that she's able to join us here also as a representative of Massey College. Um, so uh, we are now uh, honored to welcome three uh, notable public officials, uh, Senator uh, Ratna uh, uh, Omidvar, who uh, is uh, difficult to praise enough for all the work that she has done, especially for human rights and women's rights. Um, my very dear friend uh, uh, of many years, more years than he would care to admit, Ali Esasi, Member of Parliament, Member of the House of Commons for uh, Willowdale, uh, and uh, Tara Denham, uh, Director General of the Office of Human Rights, Freedoms and Inclusion at Global Affairs Canada, who will join us remotely from uh, Ottawa. Very briefly, uh, uh, I will uh, introduce first uh, the Honorable Ratna Omidvar, internationally recognized voice on migration, diversity and inclusion. In 2016, she was appointed to the Senate of Canada as an independent senator for Ontario. Senator Omidvar is a member of the Order of Canada, a member of the Order of Ontario, and a recipient of the Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, senator Omidvar, please. Thank you so much uh, for, for that introduction and thank you to the co-chairs for organizing this conference on international, I have to always do this, on International Women's Day, which is a cause for celebration, but as we have seen in the 
videos and the and the remarks of the individuals who preceded me i'm i'm not sure there is a cause for celebration when so many of our sisters so many of our sisters are suffering from the systemic discrimination that is prevalent in iran and in afghanistan um, i think this conversation today though is extremely important this conversation about inserting the word gender into our notion of what is apartheid in crimes against humanity at the UN. And it's important to have conversations like these in civil society spaces like Massey College, because this is when ideas become movements. And we need to create a movement around this notion of inserting apartheid into the, uh, our understanding inserting the word gender into our understanding of gender apartheid. I think we all have a stake in this. I have a, a huge stake in this. I am, first of all, a woman, and I, I cannot stand by, uh, see my sisters in Iran and Afghanistan oppressed to such an extent. I am also a global citizen, and I know from experience that things that happen far away have a way of reaching into our lives, even in ways we may not understand. Third, as a Canadian, with our avowed feminist foreign policy, we must surely all be appalled to see what is happening to women in Iran. And finally, on a personal note, as a former citizen of Iran by marriage, I lived in Iran for five brief, glorious years. I learned the language, I worked there, I had a child there. I felt that the revolution, when it happened, could not touch me because I was an ordinary citizen. And then, of course, you realize that you are not alone and you cannot be isolated from the political forces around you. And so me and my family, for the future of our daughters, we fled Iran like many others did. I, I don't want to repeat uh, what has been said before. But I think it is important to underline again and again what is happening to women and in Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, and what is even more distressing, as Dr. Akhavan pointed out, both in Iran and in Afghanistan, there were periods of, of freedom, emancipation, accomplishment, by women. When I lived in Iran, women were doctors, professors, lawyers. I used to teach English to Air Force, uh, to the Air Force cadets, and women were in the Air Force. In Afghanistan, uh, in the la pre prior to the, to the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan, there was a period, it was almost like a, a, a period of awakening and education, understanding what women uh, could achieve, and all of that appears to have been snatched away. It was as if we hung out a tantalizing prize for women to only have it snatch snatched away. I am particularly concerned in terms of Afghanistan about their limits to healthcare. Uh, women have been relegated to childbearing, but even childbearing has become a challenge because less than one third of Afghani women give birth in the presence of a trained uh, healthcare professional. Afghanistan is the only country in the world where women, uh, where girls are forbidden from going to, going to school beyond primary school. Uh, and their only recourse, it appears to me, is to, the only recourse for and a modicum of financial independence is to stay at home and engage in some kind of home-based self-employment. And this, in a country where half the population is women, has deep economic and human rights ramifications. In Iran, it is different, but the same underlying philosophy is prevalent. Uh, it is not a matter of behavior or attitudes, as people like to think. It, the, the, the role of women and their, the oppression of women is enshrined in the constitutional and penal code of Iran. 
this constitution devalues the worth of a woman, woman in Iran to exactly half. They are not allowed to wear what they want. They are not allowed to practice certain occupations. They have limited property rights. They are unable to travel both in Iran and in Afghanistan without the permission of a male guardian. And, and we have heard that women who continue to protest bravely in the streets, uh, they are routinely shot at and blinded. Uh, so they are unable uh, to function in the way they used to be. And when I hear all these reports, I'm frankly afraid. I'm afraid for the women. I'm also afraid that these ideas will float across the region to other places. And again, religion will be used to justify political means. And our challenge, of course, is not just to describe the horrific situation, but to imagine a solution. Now, I'm going to speak in my capacity as a Canadian senator, by the way, when I was appointed as a senator, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau appointed me as an Iranian Canadian senator. Uh, so I, I feel I have a special responsibility to work with my colleague in the House of Commons, Ali Esasi, to continue to make efforts in this, in this uh, domain. But our challenge is how do we do this? Canada does not have relationships, formal diplomatic relationships, either with Iran or with Afghanistan. And I don't believe we should. We have to exercise pressure through the many multilateral institutions that we are part of. And I believe that there was a time when Canada stood, strode proudly on the global world stage. And I remind us of the time in the 1950s when Lester Pearson won the Nobel Peace Prize for calling the first ever UN peacekeeping force into life. Later on, in the 1990s, I will remind us how, how Brian Mulroney called out the apartheid government in South Africa and stitched together a powerful global coalition to impose sanctions which ultimately freed South Africa. This, colleagues, is the moment for Canada to stride proudly again on the world stage with this idea and make it reality. So with that, let me uh, leave you with the slogan that I think we should all remember. Women, life, freedom. Food, life, freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Omidbar. And certainly one of the issues we will explore today is what more Canada and like-minded states can do to help the women of Iran and Afghanistan. And before introducing our next speaker, I note that today, by coincidence, perhaps not by coincidence, the United Nations fact-finding mission established by the uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva uh, in respect of Iran, in particular, uh, in respect of the uh, brutal crackdown on the women life freedom movement, concluded in its first report that the human rights abuses uh, uh, of that period qualify as crimes against humanity, which of course means that there is individual criminal responsibility on the part of relevant officials, uh, perhaps the question of accountability for both Iran and Afghanistan is something that uh, we can explore further. And I know that one of the panels will be looking exactly at that issue. Next, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Ali Asasi, member of the House of Commons for Willowdale here in Toronto. He worked as a lawyer in the private uh, sector and a civil servant at the provincial and federal levels before being elected as a member of the House of Commons, and he currently serves significantly for our purposes as chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee and is a member of the Subcommittee on International Human Rights. And at the risk of uh, embarrassing, since I know Ali so well, I can say that he's one of those people that has gone far beyond the call of duty to help people, even when he's not going to get any recognition. So Ali, thank you so much, welcome.
Salam, uh, bekhir. Good morning, everyone. It is uh, such a distinct honor and pleasure to be with, uh, to be here today uh, with such luminaries as you. Uh, as uh, Professor Achavon uh, very graciously uh, did uh, did suggest, uh, I'm here as uh, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Commons. And I'm here because uh, the issue that you are uh, discussing uh, and you are focusing on today uh, is an issue of grave concern. So on that note, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Professor Achavon. I wanted to thank uh, Professor Harris. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Tavakuri Tarhi uh, for convening this very, very uh, important event. Also wanted to uh, uh, thank the uh, Elohe Omidyar Jalili uh, Foundation, as well as, as, well as uh, Deb of Was for making this uh, all possible. Because we are here uh, at a time of, uh, of, of seeing urgent attention focused on the situation in Iran and Afghanistan. As you all know better than I, there is a gaping hole, there is a lacuna, in the law insofar as the situation in those two specific uh, countries is concerned. Now, I am here because I, um, I had the uh, great honor and the privilege uh, last week of welcoming over 40 Afghan and Iranian women who came together in solidarity to have a day of action on the Hill to meet with not only Canada's ambassador, for women, peace, and security, but also with distinguished members of both chambers. They were there to say that they would like to see Canada at the forefront of the fight for codifying gender apartheid. Now, uh, they were truly, truly impressive. Uh, they left no doubt uh, that they will continue uh, their impressive uh, work. Uh, and, and I can tell you, having looked at, at the advocacy that they did in uh, Ottawa, uh, how they powered through uh, no less than 13 uh, meetings in a day, and the reception that they actually uh, received in Ottawa, uh, I have uh, no doubt that we will be on the right side uh, of this issue. And we're here because of the gravity of the situation, as was uh, rightly uh, depicted in the um, uh, in the images that we saw uh, flickering before us. I also wanted to acknowledge all the tremendous work that is going on around the world. And of course, I'm acknowledging the fact that there was an ad hoc um, uh, inquiry at the House of Commons in the UK. Uh, the Atlantic Council is doing uh, tremendous work. Uh, we know uh, that four of the most impressive uh, Nobel laureates uh, are very much focused on this issue. Uh, and of course, I'm uh, referring to uh, uh, Dr. Rabadi, uh, Malala Yousafzai, Nadia Murad, uh, and of course, uh, Ms. Nargis Mohammadi, who has been advocating for this issue uh, from prison. There is also the tremendous work that each and every single one of you uh, have been doing. As was uh, noted uh, by Professor uh, Achavan, uh, what we are dealing with is essentially an accordion where he, we have seen initially the expansion of the rights of women and now its restriction. I can say, uh, and I have probably shared this uh, with uh, Dr. Achavan, some of the earliest memories of my childhood as the son of an Iranian diplomat in the 70s was to see the Iranian delegation at the United Nations lobbying day after day, month after month, year after year, to ensure that Iran would host the UN uh, Global Summit on the Situation of Women. And they did prevail. And in 1980, uh, Iran was supposed to host the United Nations. However, I don't need to tell uh, anyone here that as soon as uh, the revolution did happen, uh, we saw a very, very discourse uh, coming from the Iranian government. 
And I think it's important to highlight how we have seen that very same reality uh, from Afghanistan as well. In the 1970s, Afghanistan was one of those countries where uh, multilateral institutions were active. Uh, they were inspired by the leadership that they were seeing uh, by women. So it is high time that we did have uh, a rigorous uh, discussion uh, about this issue. The unspeakable violence that we are seeing women being subjected to in both Iran and Afghanistan tells us that it is absolutely urgent that we meet the moment and that we listen uh, to the voices emanating from both countries which are saying that there is a huge gap in international law and this is an opportunity for us to address that. So thank you all for coming together. Um, I am looking forward to uh, listening to all of you uh, and thank you uh, for your incredible leadership. As was pointed out, this is not uh, a time to uh, curse the darkness. Uh, it is the time to light a candle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ali John. <laughs> uh, next, I have the privilege of introducing Tara Denham, the Director General of the Office of Human Rights, Freedoms and Inclusion at Global Affairs Canada. Previously, she was the Director of the Democracy Unit at Global Affairs, and prior to that, she managed programming teams within the Stabilization and Reconstruction Task Force including the portfolios of the Middle East, Afghanistan, democracy and human rights, and peace support operations. She has also been deployed to Afghanistan as the chief of staff to the representative of Canada to Kandahar in 2009-10, and she joins us online from Ottawa. Uh, welcome, Tara, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am hoping I am heard okay. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Senator and the Member of Parliament for sharing their remarks and their thoughts, but also the powerful performances by Banu Zan and Jalal Mazari uh, to really emote and bring life and, and feeling into this conversation, which is so important to hear a diversity of voices. And so I, I thank you uh, for that participation and to Massey College for the invitation, but also to create this space, as others have said, for such an important conversation uh, and to bring all of the diversity of voices together. On International Women's Day, it is necessary to reflect on how far we've come, but as others have said, it's also really important to recognize how far we still have to go in protecting and promoting and respecting the rights of women and girls in Canada and around the world. We all know, and it's been said, that the, while the global community has made significant progress, challenges to gender equality persist. Gender persecution exists. Women who are agents for positive change in their communities are targeted by state and non-state actors suffering violence due to misogyny and patriarchal norms. In Afghanistan, in Iran, and in other places around the world, backsliding on women's rights unfortunately continues. Some states are revoking previous commitments to gender equality and are persecuting women for speaking up or simply for going about their daily lives. Rollbacks on human rights are coming with unprecedented challenges to democracy around the world, including the erosion of civil society space and the threats to peaceful assembly and association. Canada wants to see more and better financial and political support for women's rights and feminist organizations and movements. And we will continue to mobilize resources and support grassroots women's organizations including through Canada's signature initiatives, such as the Women's Voice and Leadership Program, the Equality Fund, and the Alliance for Feminist Movements. When we speak about Iran and Afghanistan, we need to also speak about women, peace, and security. The Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, which is a cornerstone of Canada's foreign policy, 
is not just an answer to historic wrongs and marginalization, but an opportunity to do things differently and better. Women have a right to participate in peace and security efforts and decision-making processes, and their full, equal, and meaningful participation results in better and more sustainable peace outcomes. In terms <coughs> of multilateral efforts, my team at Global Affairs Canada leads on Canada's engagement in, in multilateral human rights forums, including the Human Rights Council, currently in session in Geneva, the Third Committee of the United Nations General Assembly, and the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, which starts in New York next week. Across these forums, Canada is a strong advocate for gender equality language within resolutions, across events, and bilateral engagements. Since the creation of the Human Rights Council and building on our work before that at the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, Canada has led the resolution on eliminating violence against women and girls. I would also like to acknowledge there are past and current special rapporteurs with you in today's conference. I recognize your invaluable work and Canada is committed to supporting the work of UN special procedures. This is why in July 2022, Canada led the resolution to renew the mandate of the special rapporteur on violence against women and girls for a period of three years and expanded the scope of the mandate to cover violence against girls in addition to violence against women. I take this opportunity to once again and signal Canada's support for the work of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran, Mr. Javed Raham, and the work of the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Afghanistan, Mr. Richard Bennett. My team also works closely with other government departments, such as Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, to promote and protect the rights of women and girls. Since 2021, Canada has welcomed over 49,000 Afghans as part of the Afghanistan Resettlement Initiative. In addition to that, at, at the 2023 Global Refugee Forum, Canada pledged to provide funding for Afghanistan and neighboring countries, including women and girls in Central Asia and Pakistan who are fleeing Afghanistan. And here, I also want to take a moment to talk about human rights defenders in exile. We recognize that many human rights defenders find themselves outside of their original homeland, having to leave their communities to be safe, to keep their families safe, or to speak up. The Government of Canada is committed to supporting the vital work of human rights defenders living in exile in Canada and recognizes that they face specific and unique risks. Using Voices at Risk, Canada's guidelines to support human rights defenders, Global Affairs, Canada's, Global Affairs Canada engages with partner government departments and agencies to outline Canada's approach to offer practical advice, tools and resources to, official, to officials abroad to support human rights defenders. In addition, I'd like to note that in 2021, the Government of Canada launched a dedicated resettlement stream for human rights defenders. And in 2023, the stream was expanded to allow for the resettlement of up to 500 human rights defenders in one year. So in closing, I would like to say thank you to the rel relentless defenders of hum human rights around the world and to all the victims and survivors of femicide, patriarchy, misogyny, and sexual and gender-based violence. Canada will continue to protect and promote your human rights and the human rights of all. I know that there is a number of representatives from Global Affairs participating today, and I, I wish I could be there because I, it's, the agenda is clear. It's going to be a very dynamic conversation. So I'd like to once again thank Massey College for creating the space uh, for this type of conversation on this International Women's Day. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tara Denham, for your uh, statement, um, and thank you to everyone who spoke in this opening session. We now need just a few minutes to um, 
prepare our panelists for the first panel. We are about 20 minutes behind schedule. We like to say, Iranians, we like to say we have two and a half thousand years of civilization, but we're always half an hour late. <laughs> so what's half an hour against two and a half thousand years? But I would ask the uh, moderators for the next panel to try and wrap up at uh, 10 past 11 uh, rather than 11 uh, as originally scheduled, but not at 11.20. So we have about 50 minutes. And uh, the panel that we will begin with is entitled Deconstructing Gender-Based Persecution, Afghan and Iranian uh, Perspectives. Uh, it delves into multifa multifaceted layers of gender-based persecution as it is experienced and confronted by women in Afghanistan and Iran. And the discussion aims to highlight the complex challenges, obstacles, and discrimination that the women face and the ways in which gender-based persecution impacts their lives. To our audience, both in person and online, our moderators will leave room at the end of each panel for questions. If you're online, please write them in the chat. And if you're in the room, we will bring a mic around so that you can be heard both in the room and online. So it is our my pleasure to introduce our first uh, co-moderators, because our uh, 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 moderator, who unfortunately was not able to uh, join us, um, uh, is uh, Professor uh, uh, Rangita Silva, who is a professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Pennsylvania, a distinguished member of the uh, uh, treaty body uh, uh, established under the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination uh, against women, uh, CEDAW, um, and uh, I find it difficult to introduce her because she's also my adopted sister and one of the most extraordinary people uh, that I have met in terms of her energy, her commitment, uh, her brilliance. So I'm very sorry she could not join us uh, today because of unforeseen mm -hmm. circumstances, but she will be moderating uh, uh, online and she will be joined for moderating the questions here in the room uh, by uh, Nahid Farid, the youngest ever elected Afghan parliamentarian who now serves as a global technical advisor at the International Republican Institute. Uh, she's a Princeton University visiting scholar, advocates for women and youth in politics. She's a Forbes and Jean Kirkpatrick awardee, founder of the Afghan Education Pathways Program and a grassroots diplomat model citizen. And following the Taliban's takeover, she has been a vocal advocate for human rights and girls' education in Afghanistan and internationally. Nahid, welcome. Khosh So thank you to Rangita and Nahid. And I will now ask those of the panel members who are here in person to please come to the front of the room. Thank you. I begin. Yes. Uh, and uh, just to clarify, the reason I've not uh, introduced our distinguished panelists is because the moderators will do it. Uh, Rangita, are you with us? Yes, I am here. May I start? Okay, very good. So please, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Payam. Thank you. You are not only my friend, but my hero. To all the women and men of courage, even as we mark International Women's Day, women's freedom is under attack. We come together to redraw the boundaries of international law so that it responds to the injustices women face. The silence of international law to fully recognize 
crimes against women need to be challenged on every level. Our project today at Massey College calls for the dramatic rethinking of international law. Today, we must name a crime which yet remains without a name, but which strikes at our consciousness and our common humanity. The crimes of gender persecution and gender apartheid are our common enemy, so vicious in nature that states are entitled to or even obliged to address. History will judge us if we remain silent. Shirin Abadi, the Iranian Nobelist, has stated, women have through history risen against tyranny from Shehrazadi from Arabian Nights who told a thousand and one stories to resist beheading. Women have told stories to resist tyranny and oppression. Similarly, my distinguished panelists today will share their stories to give voice to the silenced voices of those who have experienced gender persecution and gender apartheid in Afghanistan and in Iran. I will ask a question from each of my panelists and and I will also ask a question from my distinguished co-facilitator, the Honorable Nahid Fari. She will then moderate the Q&A with our panelists. Professor Karima Benuin, Professor of Law at Michigan University, my question to you is, the absence of women in the development of international law has impoverished its jurisprudence. How can we remedy this gap? Women were denied participation in drafting the Anti-Slavery Convention. We cannot afford more gaps in international law. Nahid, in our Princeton brief that we co-authored, teachers told us all we see is darkness and ignorance among women and girls right now in Afghanistan. My question to Karima is, is this then consistent with Article 2C of the Apartheid Convention? Any legislative measures and other measures calculated to prevent a racial group or groups from participation in the political, social, economic, and cultural life of the country? Karima, if we replace gender with race, would we accurately describe a system of governance which rises to the level of gender apartheid in Afghanistan? Dr. Seema Sama, you were the first chairperson of the inaugural Human Rights Commission of Afghanistan. You were also the Vice President of Afghanistan. As you know, United Nations mandate holders have concluded that nowhere else in the world has there been an attack as widespread, systemic, and all-encompassing on the rights of women and girls as in Afghanistan. Dr. Sama, the totality of the chilling edicts numbering over 70, targeting women and girls passed by the Taliban since August 2021, does it rise to the level of gender apartheid? On an infinitely larger scale than gender persecution, do you think this is an institutionalized regime of oppression? As you know, when you and your sisters helped to draft the Constitution of Afghanistan in 2004, you enshrined in it, in Article 43, education is the right of every Afghan citizen. How is that constitutional guarantee being eroded now in Afghanistan? The Honorable Shahrazad Akbar, you too are the human, you too played the role as the Human Rights Commissioner and the chair of the Human Rights Commission of Afghanistan. How can the edicts of the de facto regime compare with historic forms of systemic and institutionalized oppression in South Africa? How can we argue that these edicts are not part of Islamic culture? Professor Homa Hudfa, you are a professor of anthropology at Concordia University. You are also a special advisor to the women living under Muslim law. You have examined the path forward to finding justice and equality for women within an Islamic framework, which is consistent with human rights. Sharia 
literally means the road leading to water. My question then to you is how can we use the Sharia, literally, which means the road leading to water, to lead to justice and fairness and equality for women? My last question is for my uh, co-facilitator and co-author, Nahid Farid. Gender apartheid codifies the subordination of women in violation of fundamental principles of international law. This systemic exclusion and subordination of women in violation of international law is compounded by intersectionality, where the interrelated nature of identity includes, but is not limited to race, religion, disability, ethnicity, sexual identity, and age. So in keeping with this definition of intersectionality, Nahid, how do you find that women in Afghanistan who belong to ethnic and religious minorities are treated even more harshly by the government than those belonging to the majority? And then my last question to all of you, how can you play a leadership role in opposing gender apartheid wherever it occurs and support the national and international conventions and litigation that will render gender apartheid criminal and a crime against humanity. Thank you. Karima, I would like to now ask you to begin. Uh, can I just ask a question of clarification, please? I was asked to prepare a 10 minute uh, sort of stage setting presentation about gender apartheid. There's a PowerPoint. Have, for reasons of time, should we just move to answering your questions instead of that? Yes, I think so. And we can uh, share your PowerPoint with everyone. Uh, okay, so you would rather than that I just answered the specific question that you posed to me rather than talking about gender apartheid more generally? Yes, and while you're answering my question, I would like you to maybe address gender apartheid that uh, that will be part of your slide presentation that we can share with the audience. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you on International Women's Day. I uh, wish I could be there in person. Uh, I cannot think actually of a better way of uh, spending this morning of IWD 2024. So um, I do have a presentation on gender apartheid. If anyone is new to this concept, I think many of you are perhaps very familiar uh, with it. It is a, a concept that has been used by women's movements in Muslim majority countries for a very long time. Uh, an Iranian uh, human rights defender uh, told me actually since the late 1980s, uh, uh, I had actually thought it was going back to the 1990s, which is my familiarity in particular with the concept uh, when it was being used by North African women's movements uh, to oppose the rise of fundamentalist uh, movements. And I think it's no accident that the first person in the UN system to use the term gender apartheid to describe the situation of human rights in Afghanistan was himself from a Muslim majority country. Uh, this was Abdel Fattah Amor of Tunisia, who who was then the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, although the position had a slightly different name at the time. And in 1999, he described uh, the first version of Taliban rule as uh, basically a form of apartheid, which he said was totally uh, sort of unacceptable uh, in light of the human rights framework. Uh, and so what we've seen since the Taliban re returned to power in 2021 uh, is basically a return to Abdel Fattah Amor's concept, to the concept used by so many women human rights defenders in Muslim majority uh, countries back in the 80s and 90s. A, because it's the most accurate description of situations like Taliban Afghanistan, where oppression of women uh, is not sort of an anecdotal human rights violation. It's centered to the governing uh, philosophy and requires an effective international uh, response. And B, precisely because the apartheid framework facilitates uh, and in fact requires other states uh, not to participate in apartheid and in fact to take effective steps uh, to end it. So uh, there's much more that I could say about gender apartheid, but I'll just go quickly to the question that I was asked to address, uh, and that is, you know, how does this fit in with the overall uh, sort of 
problem of the lack of inclusion of women in both the process of making international law uh, and in the international law norms uh, themselves. Uh, and I think uh, it, it's important to be clear that the fight for the recognition of the concept of gender apartheid and the codification of gender apartheid, uh, including in the Sixth Committee of the UN General Assembly this April, is actually building on the work that feminist international law scholars from around the world have done since at least the 1990s, both diagnosing and seeking to treat uh, problems associated with the lack of women's inclusion uh, in our understanding of human rights and in, uh, indeed, international norms that we have and the way in which we interpret them. And you can look back to the work of Professors Christine Chinkin and, and Hillary Charlesworth, now Judge Charlesworth of the International Court of Justice, who in 1992 were writing about what they saw as the dissonance between women's experiences and international legal principle. And they were arguing that to be truly uh, you know, universal, uh, these norms have to protect both men and women from the harms they are in fact most likely to suffer, that these should be uh, genuine human rights, uh, not male rights. So what does that mean when we get to this context? Uh, it means that we need to take a number of corrective steps. So international law criminalizes both racial persecution and racial apartheid. That is right. That is the holistic approach to recognizing the specificity of these different harms uh, along a racial axis. Now what we are saying is that international law must do the same thing by criminalizing both gender persecution, which it already does in the Rome Statute, thanks to the hard work of uh, women human rights defenders and international lawyers. Uh, and it should also criminalize gender apartheid, which as distinct from uh, gender persecution, really reflects on the ideological uh, nature of the project, that this is core to these systems of governance. They are based on violating the UN Charter, uh, which guarantees non-discrimination, including on the basis of uh, sex. So I think very important to understand that as we act to respond to the calls by Iranian and Afghan women to codify gender apartheid, and to push the international community to effectively end it, uh, we are continuing uh, this project of making sure that international law actually responds uh, to the needs of women. Thanks very much. Thank you. Dr. Seema. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if I would say happy International Women's Day or not, but I, I, we have to celebrate that day anyway. Um, thank you, Ranjita. I think the um, systematic um, discrimination against women in Afghanistan, unfortunately, um, uh, repeat itself because we had the first Taliban regime in 1990s when we, uh, at least I personally, I am old enough then than our young sisters here. I was lobbying for stop gender apartheid on 1990s against Taliban in different, in different level, including with the, and the US also. Uh, on that time in 1990s, when the Taliban were, were in power, unfortunately, we didn't have, we had some sisterhood from the woman living under the Muslim law, but it was not really a lot of support from the Muslim countries to be very honest. Uh, and I think Homa is here, we know each other on that time and we know still each other, continue to fight with, uh, with the... Um, and I don't forget that I was um, in a conference in Geneva with Susanna Mubarak when she raised the issue of women's rights and I stand in and complain that you don't see the situation of women in Afghanistan or you don't hear about us. We need sisterhood, we need support, we need solidarity. Anyway, so the, um, unfortunately, the, in the last 20 years when the international community was in Afghanistan and they uh, wanted to support the, uh, uh, the human rights in the country or promote development in, in Afghanistan, we had a lot of achievement, including the equal rights in the constitution. 
we really, I remember those days that we, I was fighting personally and also a, a group of us, we were fighting to include the word woman in the constitution. Because they, want, they didn't want to add the word woman in the constitution. They were saying atba, which is uh, Persian and Arabic language. Uh, um, then atba was used in the constitution in 1964 in Afghanistan. And then the next article uh, in that constitution, they said that all the atba of Afghanistan has the equal right uh, before the law. But the next article in the same constitution referred to atba as a man because all atba of Afghanistan should go to um, army services when they are 21 years old. So that was for the men. So we were not present in the constitution. So in the new constitution, which we drafted with the support of the international community in 2003, we tried hard to add the, uh, the word woman in the constitution. But what's happened when the Taliban took over the they, they abolished the constitution. It's practically Afghanistan is the only country in the planet without constitution. They do not apply their constitution, let alone now all the others uh, other law. Uh, so when we had access in compulsory access to education for all the children in Afghanistan and free, of course, they don't respect the constitution. So they don't really apply that constitution. And why I think one is the reason is clear to all of us because educated women is not easy to control. And the whole uh, notion of, of uh, controlling and uh, restricting, keeping under their own uh, way of living in, uh, is the reason that they control, they do not allow education um, and proper edu quality education. It's not only the lack of access of education for the girls in the country, but the lack of quality education for the boys as well. The number of the madrasas which is established by, uh, for the boys in the girls in the country is more scary than the uh, not having access to education because they are more radicalized. And this was happening actually even during the, the Republic, because they started this madrasas, we had one of the report in 2013 or 14 on access to education. We realized that the girls who were going to these madrasas, although funded unfortunately by the government, but they were not monitoring cl closely. And we found out that those girls who were going to those madrasas, it was mainly in the north of Afghanistan, they were so conservative, they, they were fighting with the member of their families that they should not watch television. So the, the current situation, it's very, very difficult to judge, to have access to that kind of radicalized madrasas. And some people we see in the international community and at the UN also would say that, yeah, they are establishing madrasas for the girls. But I think this normalization of Talibanization of the country is very, very dangerous and concern for all of us, and particularly for the women. The other point that I would like to mention, and I keep mentioning it, when you put women in the uh, inferior position within the family, or the mother in the inferior position in the family, you create conflict in the family. So it is with that kind of situation, with that kind of discrimination, you cannot really build peace. That some of the people are lobbying for, the lobbyists of Taliban keep saying that uh, they brought peace and security. They did not pe brought peace and security. They only reduced the, the gun, the noise of the gun. Reduced, it's not completely silenced. So how, which kind of security and peace would be if women cannot go out uh, and, and the girls cannot go to school? Because when they go out, they don't know if they come back. Within the family, because the male member of the family now trying to push and, and uh, convince women 
and their fe female member of the family to cover themselves because they will be punished. And those girls who already have the scarf that we used to wear, and they are arrested and tortured, and, and uh, a lot of other, I mean, the families had to pay ransom in order to release them. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a crimes against humanity, Ranjita, and it's more than that, I would say, apartheid. And we are all have to stand united to criminalize the gender apartheid in the conventions mm -hmm. of crimes against humanity or any other. Of course, if we can do it in ICC statutes, that would be also a dream, and we should stand for that dream. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seema. And I wanted to remind uh, our distinguished participants that the first scholarly inquiry on gender apartheid was written by Professor Karima Benuin. And uh, it is important that we acknowledge this on International Women's Day. So Karima, if you're here, congratulations once again for helping us to uh, uh, provide a very rigorous analytical framework for gender apartheid through your groundbreaking seminal scholarship. And uh, Dr. Seema, you very insightfully um, address the ways in which families are a site of conflict, power and control. And we look at women, peace and security. We look at the, the regime of conflict, but we're not looking at the regime of interpersonal conflict, which is very often uh, situated within our families. And that is why it is so important now for us to now turn to uh, Professor Homa Hudfa, Professor of Concordia University, who has for a long time been a leader in women living under Muslim law, which has at its mission looking at how the revisions in the family law can be consistent both with international women's human rights norms as well as with constitutional equal protection norms. So Professor Huma, I'm delighted to be able to ask you to go next. Thank you. Um, actually, I had prepared um, a, a talk based on what Iranian women during last year had prepared in order um, a, a bill of rights for women for after, after mm -hmm. for how, how they perceived the account. But then when I knew more about what this um, the, uh, organization, then I thought, okay, I'll talk more about um, the, the actual history of gender apartheid. Because um, last week, as we were with, um, in the parliament to discuss with situation with, with the parliamentarists about gender apartheid, I realized most people actually don't know uh, about history of women's resistance to this. But I just, mm -hmm. since there is no time, uh, I also had prepared the PowerPoint, but it can be shared later on because there's no enough time to go through the details. What I wanted to say is that Iranian revolution happened, and as it was mentioned before, many of the rights women had historically, and also those who are, that they had a struggle to get, was was um, revoked, and uh, it was a, a new system of based on Sharia law was introduced, where women were virtually valued um, half as much as men in terms of their blood money. Their their when they their uh, witnessing court would count as half as like two women would be equal to one. Um, and the age of marriage became nine after resistance was moved to 13. Um, so the, it went on and on and uh, it was segregation of buses and uh, sports centers and all of these matters. It was a shock to the Iranian women who had participated massively in the, in the revolution. So after a couple of years, of course, on the, it, the, these were announced on the 7th of March and on 8th of March, which is anniversary of it today, Iranian women launched an, a spontaneous um, demonstration that to, to this day is considered the largest, like some 50,000 women came to the street without any planning before. So not that anyone knew anything about well, International Women's Day, it was just coincidental. But since then, International Women's Day has become also Iranian Women's Day because it was the day women re really started in a massive way to resist this um, 
This system, which was probably one of the first gender apartheid ideologically and, and legally in, uh, uh, in the world. So what happened after a few years, we Iranian women got over the shock and then decided that they should do something about it. A lot of us were outside. Of course, the, the, a war had started inside as well. Those of us who were students, like myself, um, outside started to think what we should do. Of course, at that time, uh, it was a, a lot of mobilization around against the South African regime for, uh, for uh, apartheid regime. So many of us were politicized, not on the question of women, but on the question of uh, apartheid. Initially, we thought, okay, well, if we don't have the documents and go to the UN and show that if this is apartheid, then the UN would take decisive action. Of course, we're naive young students. And anyway, after a whole lot of conversation, a group of Iranian women went um, to meet with Human Rights Committee to discuss the situation, only to realize that they were told, firstly, apartheid is too important issue to be applied to women. Secondly, um, we can't, it's, um, this is based on your religion and culture, and we cannot, this doesn't apply to them, and you should go to, the, uh, to, to talk to the, your national state in order to remedy this situation. But we thought it's the state who's doing it. So this was a very disappointing situation. We came back, we started to think about what alternative we can do, but meanwhile, women in Iran are being arrested, tortured, raped, uh, executed. So we went to Amnesty International. Then the largest, still is, the largest organization uh, on, on defending human rights. We went there, uh, a group of us, but no, no, it wasn't only Iranian. Pakistan, in Pakistan, who do an ordinance was introduced in oh. Algeria. Well, uh, um, non-state actor were enforcing, enforcing, pushing women out of the public, and the state was doing nothing. In fact, the state was with them in, in, on that ground, and also Sudan had introduced this. So now we were a whole bunch of it, it, this had expanded, and we thought we have even more reason to show that if they don't do anything, then the apartheid will expand even more because. Um, the, especially in undemocratic system, they, you, they know how to politicize religion for their own game. So we went to Amnesty International. Amnesty International said, but these are, it is a very important, but it's the gender activists, not political activists. We only support political activists. Therefore, women, this falls outside our mandate. For years we negotiated and they didn't, they wouldn't want to even issue the letter of support for women who were being arrested and executed. So we went ahead, nine women from, um, from Muslim majority countries, we just, um, we just um, established um, women living under Muslim laws with two goals. Because mm -hmm. when we realized that in fact, what, what is the problem is we don't have any infrastructure in terms of solidarity, and secondly, intellectual in, uh, infrastructure that we can use to negotiate situation of, of women. Well, for racial apartheid, now we have a whole lot of literature, intellectual background. So we started to do research on that front to build the uh, intellectual infrastructure. And it wasn't done by then also, other we joined other international organization, especially after Nairobi meeting, UN uh, Women in Development meeting in uh, Nairobi. Then we, at that stage, we then got together with other international organizations, we decided what was happening is that the way even UN reads um, Universal Declaration of um, Human Rights, it doesn't include women. It is really, their, their reading is very masculine, is androcentric, and we have to change that. For that, we needed research, we needed more work, we needed documentation, and also to show that, okay, extreme maybe in some of the Muslim countries because they're also among the least democratic countries, but, but this happens everywhere. In fact, violence against women happen across the world, regardless of class, regardless of country of origin. So we started to do, uh, collect documentation. And so in order, the first thing we need is that to establish women's rights and human rights. And a lot of documentation, a lot of work went into that. And finally, in 1993, that was recognized as women's rights or human rights which is, of course, everybody knows that as a Hillary Clinton has said, but we surreptitiously had managed to leak that 
to his uh, to her office and we wanted her to use it and she had to use it secretly until she said it uh, fbi and others didn't know she's going to use it so we were sitting in beijing waiting when she said it we are already all the whole of us <laughs> we're very proud because we knew everybody else is going to use it so the intellectual in, um, infrastructure and the popularization of that helped then of course in, in that december eradication of violence uh, declaration of, of violence against women also uh, uh, came and so we continued the work but then um, because everyone was so positive after beijing iranian women were the only one they're still pushing for gender apartheid because we still lived under that apartheid but then then we moved in uh, uh, and we kept saying this should be a priority, but of course, the international community, including the feminist community, wasn't taken that seriously. Then, then Taliban first came to existence. Now we had more, uh, well, the majority, Muslim majority people came on, uh, uh, feminist majority, uh, Rawa, and of course, the, the, many of the other Afghan women joined in. So we managed to get together to provide, uh, uh, had meeting with the UN, we were very optimistic that this time gender apartheid mm -hmm. would take seriously. Then 9/11. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor Hood. For this was such an important tour de force of how the rolling back of women's rights began soon after the Iranian revolution, starting with the family law provisions, including the age of marriage for women. And thank you for going, uh, taking us through the genesis of, of the women, law, uh, women living under Muslim law, because it is important for us to understand how feminist institutions create new understandings of uh, new concepts of international law. And as you said, the language of international law itself is masculine. And that is why today's conversation is so important because it is about changing that language, changing the very norms and the values of international law uh, in a feminist interpretation. And you raise the issue of South Africa and that is why it is important now for us to turn to, um, to Shahrazad Akbar who was also a chair of the Human Rights Commission of Afghanistan, I would like you to speak about how the edicts by, uh, by the de facto regime compare with the kind of oppression at that historic moment in South Africa and how we can argue that these edicts are not part of the Islamic culture. Yes, uh, Shahrazad. So that, that's a very important question. Um, so looking at the Taliban's uh, enforcement of edicts, there are a few things that we have noticed in our work in Nawadori documenting the violations of women's rights in Afghanistan since Taliban's takeover. Um, we see a few trends. First, there are edicts and orders by Taliban that um, limit women's rights. Um, they started with um, initially an excuse that they are putting these bans in place to protect women, but we see increasing encroachment. So ban on schools, on universities, on women working in the UN, these are the big ones, but also others on banning um, closure of beauty salons, etc. So there's this pattern of increasing edicts to really close all public spaces to women and to um, force women to stay at home. In addition to having these edicts, because there's always active resistance to them. People are not complying necessarily. Women are not necessarily complying. So that, what's the other tactic that Taliban use? They put institutions in place to enforce these edicts. So it's not just edicts on a piece of paper or kind of verbal um, announcements, but we have the Ministry of Pre um, Prevention of Vice and Promotion of Virtue. We have the Intelligence Department of Taliban that are very actively involved in enforcing these edicts. Additionally, we have the provincial religious councils in every province and Taliban have replaced religious scholars in these um, councils with people who are loyal to them, who are loyal to Taliban's ideology. And in provinces that are Shia dominated, they have also replaced all Shia scholars with um, Sunni scholars who are very close to Taliban or members of Taliban. So the provincial religious councils become another part of this enforcement arm of Taliban to enforce these restrictions on women. 
This also, of course, doesn't stop women fighting back constantly. We hear about women fighting back, not only through protests on the streets, but trying to kind of walk around the, the norms and to have secret schools, to continue educating, to continue work in ways that they can. So Taliban, to continue to move in society, be in public because they have to, they need to, and it's their right. So Taliban then start, then have uh, measures in place to make this more complicated by forcing compliance on others in society. So you have edicts around, you know, specific instructions to drivers, to taxi drivers, not pick up women if they are not accompanied by a male guardian. You have specific instructions to travel agencies in Herat, for instance, in 2023, we had this instruction to not sell tickets to women who are traveling alone. So then you, you they take it a step further. But even that's not enough, right? There, what other ways in which we can completely exclude women and completely enforce this apartheid? Then, of course, they go after family members, men, um, brothers, and husbands, and uh, fathers. So, in the latest rounds of enforcement, when Taliban in late December and then January uh, arrested women and abducted women for quote unquote improper hijab. Um, not only women were arrested, but their family members were summoned, uh, or that when the family members went to uh, release them, there were instances where fathers were beaten up, uh, male members of the family were beaten up and given very strict instructions that if this happens again, you will, a worse fate will wait for you. So it's a full on machinery. There's a whole uh, lot of thought and resources, human resources as well, beyond. Uh, behind implementing this gender apartheid. And what happened in South Africa as well was that it wasn't just the policies. You know, there were laws and policies, for instance, that um, black South Africans could not stay in urban areas uh, longer than 72 hours. That was one of the, that's one of the examples or restrictions on um, prohibitions on marriage between persons of different races um, or, um, you know, other acts that this continued building up, you know, so that there was, um, separation of beaches, buses, hospitals, schools, and universities. But in addition to that, there was an established censorship of film, literature, and the media to, to really ensure that there is no voice dissenting this policy of apartheid. And then also many different ways in which people who are resisting the apartheid were suppressed held in detention, um, you know, faced all forms of violence and Taliban are doing the same thing. You know, if you protest even on a Facebook page post, the fact that girls don't have access to education, you can be detained and tortured in detention. So this is so, the playbook is the same. The playbook of full operation, the playbook of full erasure of women from the public space, not only full erasure of women from the public space, but forcing men to comply with the apartheid and also brainwashing men and women about what women's role in society is. And this is done through censorship on media and kind of censorship on books, books that have supposedly ideas against Islamic Emirates are being, uh, you know, being collected and burned and uh, universities and libraries are told to re remove these books around the issues of human rights and women's rights from their, their libraries. It's a full on mission. It's a full on mission to change our own society. And it's a long, scarily, it's a long time, long term vision, which is why the existing legal frameworks and the existing mechanisms are insufficient. We, we know it's, it's such a, such a, um, it's so important that we have the gender persecution uh, in the room statue. And it's a very important avenue for justice, but it's insufficient in face of the, the, the Taliban strategies and vision for Afghanistan, which is why this, this call for qualification of gender apartheid. I want to end with one thing that we can learn from South African experience that's also a sort of uh, um, uh, source of inspiration is the global solidarity to end the apartheid in South Africa. Just changing the legal instrument, even if we manage to do that, is not enough. We need that sort of global solidarity from men and women across the world who stand up for justice, who are people of conscience, to stand up for women of Afghanistan in the face of this apartheid. Thank you. Thank you, Shahrzad. What you so eloquently and evocatively um, shared with us really goes to the heart that the intent to maintain an institutionalized regime of systemic oppression and domination of one gender group over another is what happens in Afghanistan. So that institutionalized regime has been clearly, clearly addressed 
in your articulation of the edicts that were passed since uh, August of 2021. So thank you so much for this. And now I want to go to my co-author, um, colleague and um, co-facilitator, Nahid Farid. Uh, Nahid, you and I found in our own interviews that women who belong to ethnic and religious minorities were more harshly treated than those who belong to majority groups. So can you speak about the intersectional identity of those who uh, suffer and experience systemic oppression and domination of one gender group over another? Nahid. Yes, yes Professor Rangita, it's uh, such an honor uh, to co-moderate this a uh, rich panel uh, among this uh, exceptional panelists with you. And uh, thank you so much for being part of this panel and also part of being being part of my journey, my life journey as a as a mentor. Um, thank you so much for highlighting the issue of uh, intersectionality in the uh, gender apartheid conceptualization um, policy paper that we conducted together at Princeton University. Um, the title was Afghanistan under the Taliban, a state of gender apartheid. And we concluded that Afghanistan is a state of gender apartheid based on decrees and all the laws and orders and frameworks that Taliban put in place and implement against women of Afghanistan. But yes, Taliban are envisioning not just women, they are envisioning and targeting minorities, religious minorities, tribal minorities. And they, we just look to the angle of, of women as, as a victim. We forgot that we also have to look to other angle of women who are part of these minorities, who are part of these religious minorities. And they have to um, accept and tolerate another layer, another layer of oppression and suffering. and. Um, uh, another layer of um, uh, actually um, kind of um, legal uh, prosecution against them because be beside of being women, they are part of minorities. And we saw the Hazara genocide that happened in Afghanistan. Women have been um, targeted by the Taliban throughout the two decades of the Taliban um, um, attacks against the um, Afghanistan people. And we have around 243,000 of civilians' lives that have been lost by the Taliban in the last two decades before the fall of Afghanistan the Taliban. Majority of them belong to Hazara people. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to highlight that. And we have to make sure that women um, who belong to um, um, minorities uh, religiously and tribally at, based on ethnicity must be considered as, as those who have who have to be um, recognized as um, victims of this this process but uh, professor Rangita um, I um, don't want to uh, be between um, the questions of mm -hmm. this one group of audience who gathered at this um, um, important conference mm -hmm. and the questions that they might have from wonderful panelists that we have. And if you yeah. give me the permission, I would like to ask yeah. some questions from the, pa the uh, mm -hmm. audience. If they have some questions and mm -hmm. um, maybe um, we will have around um, two minutes for each mm -hmm. speakers to reflect on the questions. May I, Professor Rangita? Yes, please, please. Yes, I want you to take audience questions. We have the first question. Can you please hand over the mic? Thank you so much uh, for mentioning that uh, intersectionality of the oppression by the Taliban. Uh, and you beautifully put it, but I would like to also uh, ask the panelists to kind of um, address that. That, the, yes, the women or the uh, oppressed by the Taliban, and even it was oppressed by previous governments and previous uh, regimes. Um, however, the I feel like the noise what we are making about the women, which is rightfully so, is somehow covering the all the more important thing that's happening in Afghanistan. The fact that the Taliban are displacing thousands of people, and that's um, cited and researched 
by the international uh, community. More than 25,000 people were just displaced by uh, last year, July 2022. So we don't know, the number is growing. So there is a huge systematic shift about the um, demographic of Afghanistan, the way that they, uh, they are pushing the, this tribal uh, ethnocentrism in Afghanistan by pushing all other ethnicities uh, and just making the Pashtun tribe as a dominant, but also the more fundamental, um, um, fundamental view of the Islam that they are bringing with them and uh, opposing it uh, on the basically forcing it on the people, the rest of people of Afghanistan, which are the majority of people. So I would like to see, like while we are talking, advocating for the women's rights, which is, I'm very passionate about, I would like the panelists to also address how other issues, more appropriate issues that the international community is also responsible for, because they have left Afghanistan by, through a, a peace deal with the, uh, with the Taliban, uh, at the hand of Taliban, and leaving all the uh, public at their hand. Uh, I would like to have some, um, like, kind of uh, any acknowledgement on addressing uh, this issue, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I have other questions, maybe? Yes, please. Can you please hand over the mic? Hi, thank you so much. I, I wanted to ask about the issue of culture, because um, in South Africa, you know, Afrikaners, uh, and even in the Jim Crow South, uh, they would say, you know, you don't understand our culture. This is, mm -hmm. that we all wanna live like this. And there was this notion of separate, mm -hmm. but equal. Mm -hmm. And I wanna know as, as activists or as people who are dealing with this, how do you deal with um, what scholar Anne Elizabeth Meyer called a benign apartheid and this issue mm -hmm. of cultural relativism? this idea mm -hmm. of to each their own oppression, because it seemed that there in the, in the late nineties, there was a shift. So how do you, how do you combat the culturalization of the subjugation of women? Very important question, thank you. May I have one more please? Yes, please. I'm also using this as an opportunity to stand up and stretch. And my question or comment is going to be grounded through the matrix of power, power and control. And for me, all that I've heard is most excellent. But to me, the zeitgeist, civic, social, civil, is that mm -hmm. of power, retention, control by those people that fear competition. Thank you. Thank you. And a very elaborated question. Um, are we having another question? Uh, yeah. I think we should start answering the questions and Shahrazad should go first. She has to uh, pick up her child. Sure. Shahrazad, please. Who's left? Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Saib, um, please you go first. And the question was about um, other issues um, regarding the, um, the, the situation that people are having under apartheid regime, the culture, um, relativism, and also the power uh, to control. Thank you. I think uh, Homojan is also a doctor, so I'm not the only one. You can go first to Homojan if you want. But anyway, uh, one issue that uh, why we are talking too much about women's rights and not about the other uh, discrimination or violation of human rights by Taliban, I think we are talking about the minority rights as well. And also uh, women, I think violation of women's rights as a 20 million, uh, million people in the country. So that is much larger than the minority, and I'm not denying the, the violation of human rights for me as a, as a minority myself, and I feel it, and I, we raise that issue as well, the forces displacement of people, um, even the Taliban when they start arresting girls, uh, claiming that they had, don't have proper hijab, started in Dashtibarchi 
uh, from the Hazara community. And there were some, then they went to uh, Khair Khana and arrested some of the uh, Tajik uh, girls. So that is nobody denying. But we should not forget, if we push for women's rights as a human right, as we already said and uh, already mentioned by Omojan, we can also cover all the other violations as well. And we do not deny the violation of human rights of minorities, the Hazaras, the Shias, or the uh, Hindus and Sikh that we have in Afghanistan, or the other minorities. I mean, it's it's not uh, nobody denied that. But we, this particular conference, I think, is related to gender issue. That's why we are discussing this issue, and we need to talk about all these. The other point about the culture, I think, the culture is used again culture in my country is unwritten norms by men mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not ratified norms by by a parliament or by people uh, and unfortunately at this has been used in every country in different ways if you look at the sida and ratification of sida by islamic countries Every country has different uh, um, reservation on different article of SIDA. That shows the, um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the implication of misusing culture in order to control women Absolutely. again. And I, on control, I think, the women's issue in human rights is always a question of political, political power. And it's, it, it is question of power. It's question of controlling. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. which I mean, how can you deny the um, the dignity of your mother and you become a hero? I don't understand this concept. Because how can you be better than your mother, who is the important part of your being? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't understand, and it's uh, the only thing that we can. Uh, can uh, justify it is the question of power and politics. Mm -hmm. Yes, Uma John. Well, just um, a lot of things has been said, but I just want to, as anthropologist, I think I have, uh, I have a right to say something about culture. Culture is very dynamic. A culture that doesn't change is a is a dead culture. So that's that's number one rule of when we talk about culture. Culture is dynamic. Also, culture is not something that needs a state to enforce it. Like when Iranians talk about their culture and the state and police is there, well, that's not anymore culture. That's politics because with culture means it's something that everybody accepts whole, fully or partially and follow it. But if we need guns to push the culture, then we can no longer. Um, you call it culture, it will be misused. My worry about using culture is that when UN and uh, international organization use it as a, as a way of basically doing nothing, so justifying their, their lack of commitment to human rights, it's just, this is culture. This is, it's, it's as though Muslim cultures were completely different or are they the same? We have, we have this millions of Muslims that, that they live their Islam very differently. And yet UN often official use it as a as, as cursory. So I think uh, discussion of culture and the difference between power and control um, should be really part of the in, in, international debate at, at the UN, but also religion. Who is to interpret the religion? The UN uses religion all the time as an excuse of not doing very much. When it comes to women especially, they don't use religion as a way of saying, Okay, um, in Islam, um, paying interest on money is, is wrong. When, when we say that, it's, it's like uh, you're out of your mind. <laughs> or, uh, so you can see how culture has become a, a tool for lack of commitment in some, uh, some organization. And in the context of, like uh, in Iranian regime, use it as a justification of forcing their own ideology on a large number. Could I say something about this question? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I was about to ask uh, uh, Dr. Saib Karima Brown to highlight 
her insight about the three questions that raised from audience. I would like to, for reasons of time, focus on the question related to culture. I used to be the mm -hmm. UN Special yeah. Rapporteur on Cultural Rights. And uh, I think it's very important to be clear that international law is crystal clear on this point, as are UN experts. Culture, cultural rights, these are not justifications for violations of other human rights. These are not justifications for discrimination. I made this clear, my predecessor as Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights made this clear. The various Special Rapporteurs on Freedom of Religion or Belief have said the same thing. The UN Human Rights Committee has made very clear that claims to be enjoying one's freedom of religion absolutely uh, are not reasons to uh, justify discrimination against women. When the International Court of Justice looked at the Namibia case and South Africa claimed a cultural and indeed religious justification for apartheid, the International Court of Justice considered that irrelevant and found the apartheid regime to be unlawful. Part of the problem is, I think, that in academia, it has become very popular to confuse cultural rights with cultural relativism. And my plea here is really to academics to think about the, in fact, lethal consequences on the ground for women human rights defenders when you make these fashionable arguments which actually violate international law. And the very last thing I want to say is uh, I just want to make an appeal to anyone uh, listening, involved in policymaking in Canada, uh, please to hear the voices that you have heard today and to consider making a statement at the April meeting of the six Committee of the General Assembly in support of codifying gender apartheid. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Karima, because your final words really go to my uh, go to my second went went to my second question, which which is going to be answered during the course of uh, today's discussion as to the leadership of state parties in addressing. Uh, crimes against humanity, both in Iran and in Afghanistan. And I want to just end this uh, panel discussion by thanking all of our panelists for their profound insights. And we will have uh, deeper conversations into culture. I want to very quickly say as a CEDAW committee member that we have been very clear that cultural characteristics cannot be allowed to undermine the principle of the universality of human rights, which remain inalienable and non-negotiable. And we will speak of this further down the road in our next panels. But I also want to remind our Afghan women, my sisters in Afghanistan and my brothers in Afghanistan, that although the CEDO is the most reserved, is the most highly reserved uh, uh, human rights treaty within the human rights regime, Afghanistan chose to ratify the CEDAW without a single reservation. So Afghanistan did maintain a very important role and position as regards the CEDAW's universality and inalienability of rights. So thank you again to all of my distinguished panelists. We are off to a great start and a very thought provoking and insightful discussion. Thank you once again. an extraordinary panel and we could if we had enough time listen to each of you for hours so i'm i regret that we don't have more time but thank you so much uh, for our distinguished panelists both in person and online um, we are now going to have a break we are about 20 minutes behind schedule i would ask you to please come back in about 10 minutes for the next panel and i would ask all the speakers all those who have spoken to stay here for a group photo that includes our officials and thank you thank you خیلی ممنون نه خیلی جالب بودش نمیدونم اگه وقت داشتیم میتونستیم یه